Welcome everybody to the second artist's talk for Contemporary Australia Women. I'm Julie Ewington, I'm the Head of Australian Art at the Gallery and it's my great pleasure to introduce Rose Nolan, artist from Melbourne who has made this wonderful work for us, especially for this exhibition. Rose and I are going to have a conversation for a little while today about her work and then it's possible for people to ask questions. We do have two microphones, so if anybody wants to ask a question, I'll come dashing into your midst so that you can be heard by everybody else in the audience. Uh, but perhaps I'll um, sit down and join Rose and we can start. And I'm going to start from a very basic position and ask Rose, and it may not be the right place to start, but it's a place to start. Rose, why are you so interested in working with Hessian? Such a humble material that some of us remember um, fondly, actually. Um, well, um, I, I started, sorry, uh, this microphones are not my, um, you know, <laughs> not my general experience. Um, anyway, um, Hessian was something that I started to use many years ago. Um, because it was basically a, an accessible material. It was something that I could buy that was very cheap. I could buy it in large quantities um, and it, it had a, um, a non-precious um, feel to it. So it was almost like using um, paper. So it meant that if I did a number of works, if they didn't work out, I could actually just throw them away. Um, so in, in, as, an, as a young artist with not a lot of money, that was actually a really nice way to work where you could actually work through a number of ideas um, and not have to worry too much about it. I also um, really liked the quality and texture of Hessian and the way that the paint actually um, works in with the Hessian so that the texture and the weave is still present and revealed. Um, there's something nostalgic for me about Hessian as well. Um, so I think that's part of the um, joy in using the Hessian uh, and also, I've not been an artist that has necessarily wanted to use um, more traditional materials um, such as canvas or stretch canvas. Um, again, there's something a bit too restricted for me in that and something a bit too precious, which means that the idea of making mistakes becomes more problematic. Whereas through my work, I actually enjoy the possibility of mistakes occurring um, and often that can open up a whole new um, possibility for the work. That, that's really interesting because listening to you, what's really clear is that while this presents itself as an architectural structure, basically you're a painter. Um, yes, that's actually true. Um, well, that's where I see the basis for my work um, in painting. But with a work like this, um, there's something about uh, the idea of extending the possibilities of painting. So right throughout my practice, there has always been a shift from the wall to the floor and back again. Um, and so I never can really inhabit the one space for too long. Um, in terms of the relationship to architecture, there is something about the use of the soft material um, in terms of attempting to make a much more architectural structure. Um, and so the two are working sort of in contradiction with each other and the non-precious aspect of the Hessian means that um, those notions of, um, of craft um, and technique, they're, they're sort of confounded in a way. There's an there's a element to this work which has an element of uncertainty to it um, in terms of how it's made, how it's handcrafted and put together. I must say, um, I, I went to see Rose in her studio. Actually, you, you had to borrow a bigger studio, didn't you, to make this yep. from um, from Kathy Terman. And it was it was a really big production. Can you tell people, I think people would be really, really interested to know what it was like working in, you know, just make such a huge thing. Well, uh, it's interesting. But before I came today, I was actually rereading something, and it was a quote um, by Remy Zaug, the late... German artist who um, one of the lines was um, to exhibit is to make possible um, an encounter and in many respects his 
thoughts were that um, the work of art is not really completed until it moves from the studio into the exhibition space where it can actually engage with someone and where the viewer actually completes the work in some way and it wasn't just him there's a whole number of artists that um, have talked about this in a similar way so in a very literal sense um, that was completely the way this work came about where I have to actually, I had to actually get it out of the studio space into this exhibition space to complete the work um, from the very fact that um, there is no studio space that I could ever possibly afford to have where I could actually test this work out. Um, the work's made on the floor in eight sections. Um, so in a way I do the best I can um, in, in the process of making it, um, but there's a slight element of for me, the miraculous when it finally does come together in this um, space, and so there's an element of risk about it. So the work, the work is actually made in sections on the floor. So there is a lot of labour that goes into it um, on my hands and knees, painting and cutting and sewing. That's right, because I went to see um, Rose in in January. Did I come in January? Yeah. I came in January, and it was fantastic to go into the studio because a it was redolent with this lovely slightly dusty um, scent that Hessian always has. And the first person who saw um, Rose's previous work in this genre is Frances Parker, our ex-colleague who's come for the opening. And when Frances came back from seeing the previous work at Anna Schwartz Gallery in Melbourne, he said it not only was it a fantastic sculpture, he said it smelled beautiful as she went through it. And that's one of the things that people have been enjoying as they go through here. But so there was this lovely studio with the lovely scent and Rose with a, a, a domestic sewing machine, I think. Um, yeah, the, the sections are first um, sewn as soft material um, with yeah, just a really old Singer sewing machine. Um, and so in the studio, when people were, you know, um, using their band saws and their heavy kind of cutting material, I was just trundling along on the sewing machine, um, probably driving people a little bit crazy. But um, after that, it's sized um, just to give it a stiffness and then painted. Um, so, yes. Can, can everybody hear, Rose? Good. That's fantastic. Thanks. Up the back. Um, Kate Mitchell, thank you very much. She's my tester up there. All right, now this is, um, there's a very distinctive palette, talking of, in painter's language. Talk to us about red and white. Um, it's a combination that started to uh, come into the work probably in the late 90s. Um, it's, it's, for me, it's a combination of, of um, white with red. Um, so it goes back to the idea of maybe the kind of white monochrome. It, it also has, um, uh, associations to obviously historical political banners you know there is a connection um, and an interest in early um, Russian art um, and that was around a time where there was an incredible um, you know political upheaval but also um, an amazing time of creation um, for artists musicians writers architects and so in a way that combination um, has a relationship to that nostalgic historical context but it also, there's, a, um, there's an energy in the combination of red and white. So sometimes the works actually pull right back and might be totally white. So there's a very quiet, pure, um, well, an attempt at purity um, in the works. Never quite comes off. Um, and then sometimes, the, again, the introdu introduction of the red just um, creates a dynamic con combination and also has contemporary references to probably advertising and a lot of signage that we actually live with every day that we probably take for granted. Like the Coca-Cola sign obviously in red and white as it happens, which are, again um, from a not dissimilar period yes. as the early Russian avant-garde work. I'm very glad you mentioned the early uh, Russian revolutionary material because this work is called um, a Tunnel Tent but uh, when we installed it, someone said, oh my goodness, it's almost like an agitprop train. Yes. Like those yeah. trains that Trotsky had going through the countryside so that the peasants, poor things, could be enlightened in terms of the revolutionary potential um, of the regime before everything went completely sour. 
and uh, it was a very interesting and exciting moment and those artists were involved yes. in it including many women actually yes yes so i mean there are a lot of there yeah there are a lot of artists um someone like Lubyov um, Popova and Vavara Stepanova. Um, you know, there are a, a lot of women um, working then um, in combination with obviously a lot of male artists that, you know, Rodchenko, Malevich, um, who were all working together um, at that, you know, and all working across disciplines, which was something that I was also interested in. Yes. Yes, that's absolutely fascinating. That, I, I, I mean, you, it won't have escaped the notice of um, attentive visitors that several of the artists in the exhibition have interests in the, um, the lineage, I guess you could call it, of cross-disciplinary experiment in work by women artists. That's absolutely part of, of what I think we've inherited uh, from a, nearly a hundred years ago. Incredible, mm -hmm. isn't it? That's fantastic. Can you talk to us about the, since we talked about agitprop and about getting a message out, can you talk to us about the text? Um, yeah, the, the use of text in a way is like the ready-made. So I'm interested in using text um, for its, its visual and formal sort of element, so a vehicle for actually making works. Um, I'm interested in text in terms of taking it as a ready-made from our continuous conversation, continuous talk, um, and removing it from that and placing it in a new context or a new situation. So um, words and phrases that we might just think are every day or that we might not actually think about, you actually remove them, you give them a different form, you might maybe blow up the scale or you shift the scale in some way and you start to look at them in a different way. The, the other aspect to this is that um, even though it's a very bold, it looks like a very bold work, there is a delay in the readability of the text. So it takes you, I mean the other element in the work is, is the element of time and duration. So it's, it takes you a while to actually recover what the work is actually saying. Um, some people feel that it's saying lover or, you know, um, there's a number of things that you, until you actually decipher it, you've actually spent some time noticing um, and experiencing the work. Um, so the, the graphic design and the formal elements and also the cutting through of the, um, of the Hessian are all ways in which it just starts to enrich the layers to the work um, and using that text. So I'll, I'll get you, for the sake of people who might have come in lately and, and haven't deciphered it, I'll get you to, can you reveal what it, well, I mean, it's, it, it says it's very, it's very circular um, over and over again and again, um, which relates, you know, in some ways, in a very simple um, way to actually um, making the work, the continual labour in making the work, remaking the work. Um, it's a very open-ended uh, phrase. Um, my studio assistant actually at some point asked me, was there a, a sexual or romantic um, association to over and over again and again? Hopeful. Um, which I um, hadn't thought of, it wasn't in the work, but I actually enjoyed the fact that that's something that came to mind to her, for her. Um, so I laughed a lot while we were making the work. <laughs> that's really great. So it says over and over down one side and again and again, again, and again down the other. I mean, there um, are obviously any repetitive task is also recalled by such a I think you even said to me when you were having to continually explain the um, the themes of the show, and you know that this, in some ways, you you this resonated for you because you were having to say it over and over again and again. <laughs> that's right. Yes. yes. And and, um, and yeah. Yes. That that's right. One does um, do that. All right. Now um, uh, you can see that um, that people are enjoying and traversing the work. You, can, you may see as you, um, as you spend time in the museum that kids love it. They just totally love something as simple as being able to look out, particularly not so much, they don't want to look in, they want to look out. They're immersed in it. Actually, grown-ups seem to like looking out of the holes as well, which is fantastic. But I thought I might ask um, Rose if there are any members of the audience who had any, any questions they'd like to put to you. And now's the moment to... Um, to, to see who would like to pop a question. Oh, hey, Kay, I've got two. I'll, I'll go to the lady in red first. Hello, um, congratulations. This is a, I, I, 
really love this piece. For one, maybe an odd reason is that it was really loud last night and I could just sneak in there. <laughs> and it was so quiet, but also you're in the space. Yeah. It's a very beautiful space within it. Yeah. It's quite, and a lot of people were saying to me, are you allowed to do that? I said, well, I think so. You know, and you know, the view, the view out. So, I mean, it's a massive piece and um, a lot of work. And I love the graphic design element in it. Totally love it. But for me, it was the sanctuary aspect yeah. of it. No, I, context, I, I yeah. would agree with you. I said, actually, I said, thank you for raising that because it was something that I wanted to just say that the difference between the outside and the inside, um, very different experiences. It's very intimate and sensory um, and, and quiet. And it, within the work, you're getting the, um, the sort of backstage view of, of the making of the work and everything. And um, yeah, I, I know I really, you know, like being inside it too, when I was actually working on it, putting it together. Um, and I, I think I, I sort of like that in a way, the, the boldness of the outside and then the contrast to the experience inside. Um, so I hope that people are taking the opportunity to experience it in that way. Um, I've seen kids just running up and down, which is great. And um, yeah, you know, like I'm, I really am happy for people to photograph it, to to stick their hands out and you know do whatever they want to do with it because it's a work that's quite robust. It can actually take a lot of action, um, and yet it's it's um, it's very low tech. There's there's it's not there's nothing um, uh, whiz bang about it. It's very simple and um, yeah, it's like a, it's it's attempting to do something quite grand in a very simple way. Yeah, I would just amused really. Hard. Considering the power, the strength of the red and white, I suddenly started trying to imagine a blue in my father Christmas. It doesn't work. We, imagine a, a blue. I, said, I was just trying to imagine a blue and white Father Christmas, but it won't work. Yes. It's got to be red and white. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. True, very true. Yes. So it's a very lively combination. Yes, yes. I mean, the other. I guess the other aspect is also viewing it from above. There's a little bit of something going on above. Um, along the tunnel that if you're thinking about the red and white combination then there's just a little bit of a surprise up there that um, you only see if you're viewing it from the balcony which you know that's a, that's a really nice opportunity that was a nice opportunity about you know installing the work in this space is having that different viewpoint that I don't, wouldn't normally have. Mm. I didn't know. <laughs> Fantastic piece. Can you talk to us a little bit more about punched holes uh, and some of them are filled in. Mm. Um, yes, there is, thank you for that question. Um, I clearly like um, circles um, and holes in, you know, um, in relation to this work, but there's something about wanting to create a semi-permeability so, um, so that you do have that sense of you're in it but people can still see you, um, you can still see out. It's creating a, a sort of a shelter within the space but you're not completely removed. Um, and this, the sewing back in is to do with um, uh, creating an extra layer into the work um, and also maybe cutting out circles and then really realising um, that at some point based on experience from the last time I made it that you sometimes the experience just needed to be adjusted so actually from the mistake that I might have made of cutting out too many circles of needing to actually add some back in and then choosing to add some in because they had been cut out from certain sections which had a nice kind of two-tonal kind of um, effect there's some areas down here where there's yeah there's an element I guess the, the element of um, of labour and time, you know, where I've just had the time to actually consider where I wanted to create the different sort of layers to the work. And I found this time a much better cutting tool, which I was incredibly grateful for, rather than sort of cutting it out around a plate or a um, wooden disc, so I was very pleased. We have to ask you what it was. <laughs> The cutting tool. Yes. Um, it was this. I'm sure it's existed for a long time, but it was just this, you know, thing that you could just turn um, that I bought at an art shop. Like with, a cookie with cutter. A, with a, yes, with a blade in it that you could adjust. It was fantastic. Fantastic. Circular saw, or someone said. That was high tech for me. 
hope that's very high tech. While I'm down the back, is there anybody down the back who'd like to? Oh, good, here's one. <clears throat> Rose, I had a, a different um, feeling when I walked into it. <clears throat> um, immediately Russian, but I had a feeling of enclosure and foreboding. Um, with the thought of those hands going through the train, oh, okay. going to the gula. Mm, okay. um, I didn't feel safe. Yes, yeah. And it had a, a different effect to the yeah. one that you obviously had. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that's very interesting. I, I yeah, I can, can I can understand it. it. It's not something that I have experienced and I, I um, but I can completely, the picture is conjured up in my head as you say it, so I, I, I can completely acknowledge that, that that was, you know, your experience. Thank you. And before I start wending my way back up the front, any last questions from the mob down the back here? Yes, Angela. Hi Rose. Hi Angela. I just wanted to ask a bit about um, your relationships with other artists and artist groups. I know that for a long time you were involved in a, a specific group called Store 5, a group of artists working and exhibiting together. But now with this work you talk a lot about the assistants that you um, are working with. So maybe you could talk a bit about how that impacts on your practice working with other people. Yeah, um, well the it's in terms of this work it, it was really um, one assistant that came on a Friday, Jane O'Neill, who's actually from Brisbane, um, and some people might know Jane. Um, and so it was, it was a, it was a day where um, she would come for a few hours in between the many other things that she's busy doing. Um, and so it was, it was sort of hard work in a way that I always wanted to make sure that I had plenty for Jane to do when she came along. Um, and also that she felt confident to be able to do the things that she needed to do. And, and we're not talking about things that are terribly complicated. But it is a different way of working where you're um, pretty used to actually just working at your own pace. But it, it was really fantastic because while we were working we would just have really great conversations about um, different shows that we'd seen, different artists that we, you know, the work that we liked, different writers. Um, domestic sort of conversations about family and love life and laughter. Um, so it was something that really helped to pass the time while we were doing the very repetitive sort of tasks of cutting um, and painting. So it, it is a different experience for me, but it's one that I actually really enjoyed this time around. I'm not seeing any more customers down here, so I'm drifting north, actually west. <laughs> I think if there's no more um, more questions from anybody, I'd like to, on behalf of us all, thank you, Rose, for sharing. <laughs> and to say that um, Rose Nolan is a, a very respected and, and uh, artist whose work is of enormous interest. It's the first time that we've had the opportunity to work with Rose at GOMA, and I'm delighted that you could make this work for our exhibition. Thank you so much.